Sue, we're here in Tucson, the Conference Toward a Science of Consciousness in its 20th year. Uh, reflect for me what's been happening in consciousness over this period of time. Uh, any progress? Well, I wish I'd been here 20 years ago. I was here 18 years oh, ago, okay. so I'm really comparing it then. Yes and no. Um, yesterday, the day before, Dave Chalmers laid out really well the major philosophical positions, and it was extremely helpful because those haven't really changed but people have slightly moved around in them. Mm. And I think what really has changed is the neuroscience. Uh, 20 years ago, we hardly had any brain scans. Um, we didn't have the internet to kind of think about things in those ways. Now we have the most fabulous ways of looking into what the brain's doing at all different scales, which just pushes the problem deeper and actually makes it worse. I think if you can imagine the brain as a black box, you can almost think up anything. You know? <laughs> um, but the more you learn about how it works, how different bits of the brain deal with decision making, with vision, with uh, action, with whatever it is, and then you say, but what about consciousness? <laughs> right. Where does this experience, this, you know, the, the, the right. way your hands look to me, the reflections of light right. on your glasses, how, how does that fit in to, to what the brain's doing? So that has has got worse if you like have we got made any progress mm, i think we've made huge progress in understanding how the brain works and but of course that's not the question that's not the question and that's why i'm hesitating <laughs> saying but uh, am i going to say none at all on consciousness yeah. no i think one important thing is that most people working on consciousness would agree that what we're talking about is subjectivity subjective experience what it's like to be me now sitting here the experiences of the colors and sounds and so on that means you can kind of pull people back who go off in all kinds of ridiculous directions some people dealing with what dave chalmers would call the easy problems which of course they're not easy <laughs> but you know but they're really not talking about consciousness others like deepak chopra who says something like you know creativity is it comes from consciousness but Actually, he's talking about something that most people would call unconscious. Right. And, and so if we keep coming back, as people I think are getting better at, to it's the subjective experience that's causing us the problems, um, there, there we're getting better at it. And the problem is, is still there. I do not know how this experience relates to what I know about this brain. Other people have told me that, but what you've said is actually even more interesting. You've said the neuroscience has made it worse, not better. <laughs> now, most people say you know, we've made enormous progress in neuroscience. We can understand part of it. We, we know we're not there. We, the more we do, eventually we will, we will explain it with very high confidence level uh, of many of my neuroscientist friends, including at this conference. Um, but what you're saying is that more neuroscience, the more you're seeing how different parts of the brain are doing things, and it's getting filled up. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's getting filled up, and there's no room for the <laughs> right. mythical little me right. who would control, right. pull the strings, right. or the me who would be the subject of my experience. That's right. exactly it. That's a yeah. nice, nice um, metaphor, if you like. It's getting <laughs> filled up. Yeah. Where is the room for consciousness? Yeah. Which does what I think it must do: push us and push us and push us until we admit. I would say that all our intuitions about the nature of consciousness are wrong and we have to throw them out. Intuitions like there's a conscious me, self, who is having a stream of experiences and that some things in the brain are conscious and some are not and there's a difference between them and we can find the neural correlates of consciousness. I mean, all these things, it seems to me, are based on false intuitions. So the more the neuroscience pushes us at some point, they're going to crumble. But to me, the, the interesting question is, what, what, how are they going to crumble? What, what's going to change the position from where we are now? It's a mystery to where we will at some point get, where we know what it is we're working on and how to, how to understand it better. So if we look at the total spectrum of ideas about consciousness, starting from the left of uh, not left or right, not necessarily related politically, uh, to eliminativism that consciousness doesn't exist, it's illusion, etc., to hardcore reductive materialism, to non-reductive materialism, where it's sort of materialistic but you can't reduce it, uh, to some of these new theories in, in the middle that deal with uh, whether it's quantum physics or integrated information, ways that are beyond the normal physical world that we, we see, and then moving on to uh, uh, idealism uh, and even people who say that consciousness is the only 
reality. Uh, uh, and, and, the, and the piece, even before idealism, is people who say that consciousness is a fundamental part, irreducible part of reality, maybe along with some other things, the physical world, and then those people who reduce, who get rid of the physical world altogether. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and these are your friends, they're my friends, in every one of these categories you can list a friend, right? <laughs> yep. How is that, and they're all smart. But that's how it should be. That's what it means to be a scientist, or I guess a philosopher, that you you, you love to battle with the ideas and you know that your own ideas are going to change and move forward. So somebody who comes along and disagrees with you is all part of that process. I mean, that I'd occasionally meet scientists or philosophers who are so set in their There are some here, actually, <laughs> Tucson, who are so set in their ways. There's really no point talking to them at all. But the vast majority, if I disagree with them, will enjoy the disagreement. And I'll be going, but that's ridiculous. How can you say that? And they'll be going, no, it isn't. You know? that, I mean, I wouldn't want to be a scientist if it weren't like that. Yeah, but, but this, in this particular science of trying to understand consciousness, the, the, the vast range of different ways to explain it, I, I can't think of any Anything else in, in, in the totality of knowledge that has such a broad range of potential explanations that are that are propounded by intelligent people. But I think that's just the stage we're at. I think there have been plenty of examples in the history of science. I mean, take take the um, the, the search to try and understand the nature of life. Sure, sure. When people were utterly baffled and they invented the élan vital, the yeah. life force, that, right. you know, something dies and, oh, where's, it, where's life yeah. gone? Right. What is life? Right. Oh, what is right. it? Right. And I think we're at that stage with consciousness. Um, we're asking what is it when we haven't even got a definition of the thing we're trying to find out what it is. Mm. Mm. All of these things seem from some way or another to be possibly helpful in understanding it, and we're grappling around with a mystery. At some point, some of these will get ruled out. And personally, I would say that the extreme materialism and the extreme idealism are utterly doomed, and there are quite a few of my friends <laughs> who steam despite that to, to hang out in those camps. But if you're an, a, a, a solid materialist, you can't explain consciousness. That's the hard problem. It looks insoluble. It seems to me it comes about from making a mistake right at the beginning. Mm. If you're an extreme idealist, well, the same. If it's all consciousness all the way up, well, how can you explain the fact that we agree about these chairs right. and we can do experiments? You can't. So then you get all these attempts to do something in the middle. And if you will reject neuroscience as being the key ultimately to solve the hard problem of the inner phenomenological experience of consciousness. Doesn't that push you to either one of the extremes? You said something strange there. You said, if I would reject neuroscience, I wouldn't reject neuroscience. Somehow I think neuroscience is going to help us. What I am thinking at the moment is we don't know how. At the moment, we're gathering all this information, as you do in the early stages of any science, because you don't know what questions to ask. So you just keep asking questions. How does this work? What does this do? How does this relate to that? And we're gathering this masses of information. I think it's making the, the, the problem of consciousness worse, because we haven't yet found what are the bits, what, what is a better question to ask than the hard the hard problem But in principle, can neuroscience solve the hard problem of consciousness? In principle. I don't know. If, if I look forward to think what's going to solve it, one possibility, and I think this is on the whole where I'd go, is it's a false problem. It's a problem that comes out of thinking about the nature of our minds wrongly. We're deluded into imagining that there's a conscious self in here who has a stream of experiences uh, that goes on all the time and it's a persisting self that's me and it has free will and it has consciousness and, and so on. Now those intuitions I think are false but they feed into this idea that there's something called consciousness itself that is separate from the, the stuff going on in the brain. That's dualism, that's a form of duality that doesn't make sense. Um, so Somewhere in there, we may get the neuroscientific um, breakthrough that, that, that stops it being mysterious in that way. Or another possibility, I think, is that um, we, we will um, so come to understand how the brain works that somehow our, our, our worry about it slithers away. So... Um, there are people like the Churchlands, for example, who say, well, 
the experience of... I can't see anything beautifully coloured as, as an example. I've got some red here. They would say the experience of this red just is the firing of neurons in V5 and the whole system through the, you know, colour opponent system and all that. that it, that's what it is. Identity theory. Yeah. And, you know, I go, yeah, yeah but mm, I, I don't get how it can. How can it be? I just don't get it. And they would say, well, it's like saying light. I mean, look at this light. You know, I'm looking at the light bulbs there. Um, I'm quite happy to say that light is electromagnetic radiation. I know some basic physics, mm -hmm. not that much, but, you know, it doesn't bother me. So one possibility is it just won't bother us anymore. Once we know enough, it won't seem like a problem. The mystery will disappear. Another possibility, the third one, is, is a dramatic breakthrough that no one's thought of, that no one was looking for specifically. And uh, we'd all go, oh, of course. <laughs> well, I don't know what it would be, obviously.